morning and welcome to Then and Now. My name is Jim Amon. This is a four-part series in human trafficking. I have two very special guests with me today, one Ray Bouchard, uh, the author of The Berlin Turnpike, and also a victim of human trafficking, trafficking Marie. Uh, so thank you very much for being here, and uh, th uh, welcome to Then and Now. You're hey, welcome. Ray, Ray, I'd like to start with you uh, today. Um, Ray, you and I have been working now, I think this is going on our third year, maybe even our fourth, you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong, uh, on the issue of human trafficking. We've gone to the state legislature uh, for legislation. Why don't you give a little bit of background, A, about uh, the, the, the book. I know in our first series we talked a little bit about the Berlin Turnpike mm -hmm. and what brought you uh, of getting interested in uh, helping in the cause of human trafficking. Sure, I got interested in human trafficking and working against it uh, over 10 years ago. I worked for a number of nonprofit organizations around the world uh, and saw this crime happening all over the world, but really didn't even know what to call it. This was in the late 90s. And then saw it happen in New York with a little five-year-old girl who was in foster care. She was HIV positive, and uh, the city worker told me that her mother had tried to sell her as an infant uh, for $200 on the streets of New York. And she told me this happens all day, every day. And I thought to myself, why isn't this the biggest story? in the news all day, every day, because it was a crime that kept happening. And then as I looked into it more, I realized it was a multi-layered, very complex situation, human trafficking, especially as it exists here in the United States. In 2000, we passed a federal law uh, defining and really spelling out what the uh, crime of human trafficking is. The very first trial to take place convicting someone under that law happened here in Hartford in 2007. And that's what my book focuses on because that trial, in that case, United States versus Dennis Paris, completely explains how the crime of human trafficking and more specifically commercialized uh, sexual exploitation in the United States. And much of it happened out of motel rooms in the, on the Berlin Turnpike here going south out of Hartford and the Silas Dean Highway going south out of Hartford. And I wanted to illustrate how this happens in the U.S. And if it happens in Connecticut, it certainly can happen anywhere. You know, that's very intriguing. And I know when you and I first sat down and had this discussion, uh, quite frankly, the only real background I had on human trafficking was the movie Taken, as we know now, that was really far-fetched and... Um, though good movie, not very uh, real yeah, to Yeah, it opened the up the discussion to a lot of people. But it so really that's did. Fine, yeah. And uh, I think the other issue, even for myself being a former legislator, was that this is not an American problem, no, no, no less than it's a Connecticut problem. It's, mm. it's Asia, it's you know, Mexico, and uh, it's, it's there. It's not us. So you really open up uh, our eyes to that. And legislation. Um, can you talk about some of the things that we were successful at uh, the, in the last couple of years? I think that would be interesting to people to listen to. Here us. in Connecticut, we had some of the weakest laws against human trafficking in the nation. And uh, there were some organizations, some advocacy groups that uh, rate the state laws across the country. And we were rated at, a, at an F at one point. Uh, so two years ago, uh, one of the issues you and I took on, as you remember, was trying to rid uh, escort ads and get rid of them out of the Hartford Advocate news, uh, newspapers. Uh, Hartford Advocate, owned by the Hartford Current, the nation's oldest newspaper, and here they were running these escort ads every week in the back of the Hartford Advocate. And they had done so for decades. In fact, this, these ads were the very channel that Dennis Paris used to, for his, what he called an escort agency. Uh, in four years until his conviction. Well, five years after his conviction, five years after the Department of Justice proved these were human trafficking ads, some of the girls 14, 16 years old, Harvard Advocate's still running the ads. So we got a law passed, and this was in 2012. Uh, three weeks after the, ad, the, the law went into effect, the ads were gone from the Advocate, and they've never come back. Uh, that was one, that was our, our first good hit. Last year, we really went for broke on it. We passed a, a, a very comprehensive law that changed the definition of human trafficking in Connecticut uh, and mirrors the federal law. So we're able to convict now under Connecticut law. Before it was just too weak, the prosecutors wouldn't take it. Uh, there is a second chance law so that uh, people who have been uh, convicted of prostitution arrest can have their records expunged if they're human trafficking victims. Uh, it increased the penalty for Johns, it increased the penalty for pimps, it calls for signage for help 
around the state so mm -hmm. that uh, people can understand that there is right. a way out of this life. Really great comprehensive law and what we were very proud of, two things. One was that Marie, when she testified and had the courage to get up in front of the cameras in front of the legislature and said, here's what's going on, here's what my life was at, here's what's happened to me. Two years in a row she did this and the effect of that was not only did the laws pass, they passed unanimously. Right. And this day and age, that doesn't happen very no, much. Ab absolutely, absolutely not. And I want to uh, go to Marie now. And first of all, thank you for all your effort on getting these bills passed. And I know it does take a tremendous amount of courage. And I know one of the things that you talked about in one of the press conferences was exactly what one of the laws does is sponging records. Why don't we start there and say, why is that important? Obviously, to someone like yourself, um, why does that law, how does that affect you personally? Well, as a victim, um, the courts really didn't have anything to help me with. They couldn't help me unless I was prosecuted as a criminal. So unless they, there was no place to put me as a victim. There was no housing, there was no help, there was nothing, there was no place to put me. So as a criminal, they could help me. And so in the end, it was great because I got the help that I needed, but uh, you know I was left with a record. So right. to get rid of it would be was awesome. So at this point, I, I don't know, Maria. <coughs> at this point, has the law has it helped you? Has it affected your life? Were you able to get it sponging in the middle of the process? I don't know where you are right now. As well, um, well, I was. It was wiped off my record. Fantastic. That's awesome. awesome. Well, we're hoping that not only did that happen for you, and that you know, I really didn't know the answer to that question. Uh, mm -hmm. So, for me personally, if I had one little fingernail of help uh, to to ha make that happen, it was all worth uh, Ray coming to me and us working together to make that happen. So that's awesome. I'm hoping that it's affected a lot of other uh, people too. Ray, I think the other thing that I always get, and maybe you do too, and I'm, I'm assuming Ray does. You know, when I talk about human trafficking, especially around a dinner table or to friends or whatever, about why it's such an important issue for us to, to recognize, uh, because it could be their daughters, uh, their nieces, uh, or sons, and, uh, and, mm -hmm. and whatever, uh, is that people say, well, why, you know, if, if I was brought into this business and I started, to, why can't they just walk away? You know, they, they have this illusion that, you know, you can just go whenever you want, but there's a reason why they call it human trafficking. Maybe you could mm -hmm. help make people understand uh, what happens. It's not as easy as you think, um, because I mean, look what happened when I when I was caught. Finally, there was no help for me. So when you get if you leave, what what are you left with? You're left with nothing, and it's very tax. It's very. You're unsure what the other party is going to think if you leave. Um, if you're going to go and tell, if you're going to talk. And that's the main concern. So you're not going to trust the other person when they leave. Is it more, do you feel at that point, is, is there a threat? Is there intimidation? Yes, yes, yes. And do they, is that usually part of, uh, of keeping people close to them because they, they do intimidate, they, they do hold back on the money, they do kind of control? Right, they, they control the money, they control everything, and most importantly, they keep your identity, your identification. That's the first thing they take from you. So with that being, you don't know them, but they know you. So even if you did talk, it, what are you going to say about them? But they know all about you. That's an excellent. Well, so yeah. you didn't know your pimp's name, his real no. name. No. But he knew everything about you. Yes. Yeah, very interesting. Now, um, Ray, you said earlier, and I'm interested what's happened over the last 14 years, that the first legislation was back in 2000, yes. I think you mentioned. Um, have you seen a tremendous increase because of the internet? Is, has the system changed? Or I know you were talking about obviously motel rooms and those things still yeah. occur. And I think we, we even talked about it's as easy as ordering a pizza. It's become easier than that. Correct. I mean, Talk it, a little bit about that. There are escort agencies now on Facebook uh, that advertise all day long on Facebook. And, and we've been, you know, uh, I've talked to you about it. We worked for a long time to get Facebook to rid their pages of just child pornography. And now they've taken measures against that. But 
the amount of escort services that are just advertising there. And what this allows the escort, we call them escort agencies with their prostitution rings, what they're able to do is now go to men instead of waiting for men to come to them. And each one of these are links to outside websites that gather your information. Um, if one girl has her phone number posted on Backpage or one of the other websites where escorts or prostitutes or trafficking victims are listed, you can take that phone number, do a search for it on a website that's specifically meant to look for girls who are being worked via their phone number. And it will show you all of her listings, all of her reviews, every place she's worked. Uh, and this is how recently we were able to find the fact that there's a girl being worked at a motel in uh, Wethersfield and at a spa in Wethersfield. And all the reviews about what that men are writing about what she does mm -hmm. and the services you can, get, you can get for 40 or 50 or $60. Let's talk about the men. I mean, obviously, you know, f uh, since caveman days, it seems like the men always gets a pretty clean break in all this, not only being uh, the pimp, uh, uh, the perpetrator, the pimp, etc. But what about the John themselves? Isn't there any responsibility uh, on the men's part? And are we doing anything in that regard? Well, let me just answer real quick. But the real expert is is, is or Marie, agree you on can that. Be very happy. It's, it's interesting what's happened though with Canada, uh, and I. This is probably something that's going to come come south. Canada's Supreme Court last December wiped out all of Canada's anti-prostitution laws. So right now in Canada, prostitution is in effect legal completely in the whole country. And there's this very large sex tourism industry now building up of Americans going north to Canada. And the parliament's rushing to pass laws to try to figure out what they can do to stem this tide. And what they're thinking of doing is placing laws that prosecute the Johns and not the girls, the customers and not the girls. Uh, that worked in Sweden, much smaller country, we'll see what happens. But as to their motivation, their compulsions, uh, Marie is the expert on that. What, what, I sure. mean, what make, I know, it was a question. What responsibility do they bear? I mean, what? I mean, it seems like you, you get arrested, you get in trouble, mm. you're, right. you're, you're right, and, but the guy right. seems they give him a slap on the wrist and there's not I mean, a big I think deal. It, I think it should be the same for them as it is think. for us. You, th you would think. Yeah, I don't think, I you know, but I mean, there are different layers when it comes to catching girls. I mean, girls have a lot more issues when they are found in this world, you mm. know, in this world. Um, I mean, we have drug addictions, you know, a lot, a lot of them are thieves or, you know, um, a lot of assaults on the records, you know. So, I mean, there's just a lot of different layers to the girls than the men. That That's are. true. Yeah, I can I can understand that, but still, I mean, you would think. I mean, obviously, let's let's even talk about um, uh, when I answer an ad like that, and then I go out and I find out the girl's underage. What, what happens in cases like that? Is 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 the prosecutors? Do they go hard after the yes. John? They in do. Connecticut Thank now, God. the law we passed this that. year: if you are arrested uh, soliciting an underage girl or boy. Yeah, you're gonna do time. Good. That's Good. A, that's the thing. Good. But that brings us to the you know that brings it. The focus has been <clears throat> has been on younger people in Correct. this in this world. Correct. And unfortunately for uh, people like Marie, who's older than 18, there are no services for her. There's no help for her. It's it's been years since we met. Uh, the day we met at the Harvard Community Court, she had just come off a 30 day stint mm -hmm. for uh, solicitation for prostitution, and I watched the men who had been arrested for, for soliciting to these girls, and their punishment was to write and read an essay to the girls who had been arrested. Oh that was their punishment. Yeah. So there's a huge imbalance there. There's also a huge need for care for the victims like Marie. It's been six years since I've known her. We have tried all this time to get her services. And because she's over 18, there's just none, okay. even though people promise there is. Right. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. All right. So obviously, Marie's not the only one in the universe no. that, that has this problem. It, what do, like some of the groups that supposedly are supposed to be helping Marie, uh, why aren't there services for them? What is their reasoning? Do they concentrate just on the younger population? Is it resources? Is it a lack of knowledge? Is it nobody cares? Well, what I, is I, it? Or a little bit of everything I just said. I, I don't know what they would say, but what I've what I've witnessed is they they do much more effective fundraising if they mention young people, children in their fundraising and in their focus, than everybody's willing to give money. 
Um, however, in Connecticut, if they do find victims, uh, and in 2012 there were 88 victims who were underage victims of human trafficking in Connecticut, the DCF, Department of Children and Family, is automatically called in and takes uh, over that case and takes care of that child. The difficulty with that is 86 of 88 of those children were already in foster DCF care who were trafficked in 2012. Mm. So that system's obviously broken. Uh, so the organizations that are meant to care for victims do focus a lot on younger people. And I don't know, what response have you got when you've called for help for some of these organizations? Not much. I just don't think that they know, I don't think they've come in contact with enough of us to know what we do need. And uh, I mean, it's like they all want to see us go to college or get some help, but they have no resources, no one in these colleges to help us. So it's like they could hand us an application, but what good is that going to do us? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of us barely have a GED or an mm -hmm. education. Um, and so where is that going to get us? And then they don't have any real funding or scholarships to give us. Cause they don't have that in place yet. So let me add, so let's let's talk about that a little bit further. So, all right, now you you get out, you're doing your best uh, to to try to live a normal life as you possibly can uh, under the circumstances that you've been through. But I, obviously, I'm sure there has to be some sort of a place where you can go for therapy for. Uh, helping with alcohol or, or drug uh, abuse and those sort of things, you would think, right? But you're yeah. telling me that that's not the case. So you you may be able to answer this, I'm not sure, but you must know other people in the same situation. What happens to an individual when that occurs? You're out, but then what happens? There's nothing for you to go for, to help to. Yeah. So what, what occurs sometimes? Uh, some you go back to the lifestyle. You go back to the lifestyle. So you, you go back because that's the only way Obviously, you're back into um, mm. the drugs, the alcohol, and as bizarre as it may seem, maybe even the, the, the support that you're thinking you're not getting out there, you feel there's something, something's there for you, that at least you got somebody that mm -hmm. is what they call themselves supportive. It's the so one it's, a vicious, it's a vicious circle. Yeah, it's a culture that understands you. So how much, you is that, how much do you think that costs society? I would like to put a number on that. I mean, in, in terms of how, how, you, how can you put a number on that? But, and that's the difficult part is, and what many of these organizations that claim to be advocacy organizations are, is when you meet a victim of human trafficking who's been in it even for a couple of months, the layered difficulties they have, uh, and you have to deal with it as their advocate, you have to stay with them. You can't just have them call in once a week or have them go to a couple right. of meetings. It is daily and every day. They've got legal issues, health issues, emotional issues, drug issues, family issues, STD issues. Um, and, and all of these have to be dealt with. And they're all going to be motivating this person to not making good decisions and be frustrated and run again. Uh, so yeah, pretty much the entire system and lack of support and help just funnels them right back into that, into that system again and, and, and feed the demand that's now just exploding because of the anonymity that the internet and the ease that the internet uh, mm -hmm. offers. You know, mm -hmm. These guys can go online and find girls all day, every day, 24 seven. Doesn't matter time of year, doesn't have to be, you know, doesn't not like, you don't have to drive around the street anymore and look for a girl. It doesn't have to be a nice day like it is today. Uh, if it's snowing and raining, you know, you weren't gonna find anybody. Now, I mean, two o'clock in the afternoon on a Tuesday in February and snowing, you can go online and find anybody, anything and anybody you wanna do. So. The demand is there, and so everything's pushing these victims right back into it, and nobody is sticking by their side and trying to get them out. You know, it's a, it is it's a it's a obviously a very difficult issue to try to deal with legislatively, and uh, obviously our society there's something. Well, I guess not just our society. Sounds like the whole world. Mm -hmm. We have a serious sexual problem, yeah. with, and how to deal that, deal with that uh, to the point where. Um, obviously, it's a multi-billion-dollar business, um, and uh, uh, I'm sure that it costs us as taxpayers billions of dollars on top of that. Um, but I think we've taken our first few steps, and I always say that you know there's reasons why we were having this conversation here today, and the reason why the what three of us are put together is a very small, minute group of what's happening worldwide, but getting the message out and Marie having the courage to come forward. Yeah. You know, if every one person that we might have helped or 
you know, have their records uh, cleaned and those sort of things is really positive. But we got, obviously we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, and my biggest concern, obviously, is certainly the, the, the kids that are underage, but certainly Marie on what happens to a victim uh, after this um, uh, this lifestyle, uh, where do they go from there, and how can we best get them to live a normal life as best they possibly can? Um, I, I think the other problem that I've seen in conversations, uh, again, is that they just believe that, hey, you know, um, they they chose this lifestyle, they live this lifestyle, and who really gives a damn? And I think that's really the biggest problem that I have, um, because. You should give a damn. Uh, uh, we have a we have a society that uh, is a throwaway society in many instances. But um, I think uh, most people, like Marie, have a life to live and can go forward and live a great life. I not, went down to Washington uh, with uh, Representative Ritter and some others uh, last year, I guess it was, and uh, met some other victims and who have been able to get back to college, get their degree. I think one one was in a healthcare and nursing degree. Yeah. Uh, so they, you know, they can be... We, we hear about the success stories because they're, they're brought out. Unfortunately, and so look, they're very few. For Very, very yeah. few. And, uh, you know, we're normalizing this lifestyle like it is a choice. And if you look at TV shows, how many of them are, are about women and men who work in this field and it's comedy or it's entertainment. So right. now we look at it as an entertainment or we see news stories and of course, you know, if if you're if you're John, if your guy is looking into into this and, and you're you're paying for sex, the girls aren't putting out there that I'm some lonely, sad human trafficking victim. They're going to say I'm doing this independently. I'm having a great time. I love this. I love doing it. I just going to college. I'm just a happy party girl. That's you know because that's what they're selling. So that idea is is, is permeated and really saturates into the cultural psyche. So we think, okay, they're all doing it as a choice. Well, it's all an act. The whole thing is a lie. Do you think the legalization of it in, uh, in Nevada and other places that are talking about it, do you, do you think the same thing still occurs? Is the, is the person still damaged uh, when it's over because they chose that lifestyle? Or do you think that uh, it's just camouflaged, as you said, uh, that everything's hunky-dory and fine, but yeah. in reality... The camouflage is a, is a very good word because that's what happened in Rhode Island. And until just two years ago, people don't know this, not many, the indoor prostitution in Rhode Island was not illegal. So because of that, pimps would bring their girls from all over New England, even New York, to operate out of brothels and strip clubs in Rhode Island with in complete Im immunity, impunity. It, it was, they just could do whatever they wanted because it wasn't legal. There's nothing the cops could do. So... Uh, there, it, again, it was a lie. It was camouflaged by this, this legal practice of prostitution, but no one knew what was going on under the layers of that, mm -hmm. that the girls were then, you know, taking all the money the guys were giving and had to give them to their pimp. Um, this is exactly what happened in the Dennis Paris case. He would bring girls to, to a particular nightclub in Providence and work the girls out of there and, they'd, and make a fortune in one night. Mm -hmm. Nothing police could do. So legalization is... Uh, it is a lot of people think it's the answer, but it creates uh, a, the very serious unintended consequence of hiding human trafficking uh, very effectively. Maria, direct question, and um, I, again, I don't know the answer to it. Uh, do you obviously you know other victims like yourself? Do you know anybody that says I absolutely loved what I did and I can't wait to go back? Or, or what? What do you? Not too many. I don't know. Uh, I don't know any other victims, to tell you the truth. There aren't many of us out there. Mm -hmm. It's not like there's a support group where they get yeah. together. Yeah. There should be, yeah. but they're out there. It's just right. there's, there's no group or place where they can... Uh, and we've talked about this a lot. I've talked about this a lot with Marie. It's like if we could start something like that where they could get together in a room with confidentiality and say, here's what happened to me, and talk it out amongst themselves. Right. They never get a chance to do that. That just doesn't exist the way it does for people with other issues in their lives. Well, maybe this is another opportunity for us to, to explore those sort of issues of sitting down with other people. And, and, you know, I think that would be extremely helpful, I would assume. I would assume it would. Oh, yeah. I would assume. 
Uh, what's the next steps, Ray? What do you think? Where, where do we go from here? Uh, and obviously, like I said earlier, we've got a lot of work to do. But mm. any, Two areas any I'd ideas? like to focus on. One, and most immediate, is getting help and real care for uh, victims who are not minors, of age victims, uh, like Marie, who come out of the lifestyle and need help with drug rehabilitation, their legal issues, uh, emotional issues and scars. Uh, we need to get them help. These are victims. Uh, we've helped victims of other tragedies, other crimes. Uh, we still, as a society, kind of look at these as throwaway people, as yeah, you said. Yeah, yeah. So sure. do they really need care? Or they chose us. So it's, we're, we're changing our mindset into criminal to victim, and that's going to take time, but that's where we really need to get it. Secondly, and this is a whole other topic, but the other side of human trafficking is forced and exploited labor and looking at our supply chains. This isn't the sexual side of human trafficking. Correct. This is the forced labor, the slavery side of human trafficking. And that's something we'd really like to address in the legislature uh, this coming session. Marie, any ideas, any thoughts um, that you think could be helpful to our cause? I have no clue on this one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah human trafficking, I mean, the, uh, you, you talk about that too. And again, you know, all of us as consumers, many times we, we turn a blind eye to it that, geez, I got the product, it's a decent product, it's cheap. Uh, nobody wants to hear that uh, you have kids, you know, nine, ten years old uh, working on, you know, 14 hour shifts or whatever in very oh, cruel horrible. conditions. And, you know, you, you know, at our, our generation, hmm. Ray, um, you would think that, well, wait a minute, you know, didn't they, they freed the slaves in 1865 and, you know, we talked about child labor laws and the turn of the century and those sort of things. You think it's disappeared, but actually... Uh, There's it, more slaves in the world today than at any other time in human history. And I was hoping you were going to make that point. Yeah. Right? And it's not just the cotton that we got get from Uzbekistan or the factories that burned down in uh, Bangladesh. It's shrimp that we eat, the coffee we drink, right. the chocolate that we eat, the diamonds we wear. Many of these products that we go and see, wow, this is a great price. There's a reason it was a great price. It's because barely anything, if anything at all, was paid for on the labor of that. Somebody suffered to make that product you're getting cheaply. Well, it's pretty sad that uh, that's a fact of where we are in the world, that there's more slaves now than ever before. And yeah. uh, it's uh, obviously the three of us have a lot of work to do. Yeah, we do. Uh, so we're up you're to ready? the challenge again if we can take uh, <laughs> one, one person at a time and everybody else tries to get more involved and we educate them. But... The facts are, as we close here today, that it is a multi-billion dollar industry. It's certainly something that many of the gangs uh, mm. have now turned from drugs to doing uh, uh, prostitution uh, or what they say human trafficking uh, because A, it's profitable and B, it's easy and uh, usually the pimps can stay out of getting in trouble. Uh, they utilize these individuals time and time again uh, as their product uh, over and over again. They don't have to worry about supply and demand, and we have to educate people of how important that is. To raise point, exactly the same thing, human trafficking as far as uh, dealing with slavery and slave labor is another issue that we need to talk about maybe in the future. For now, I want to thank everybody for the, this, again, ending our fourth part series on this, uh, the show then and now. I'm very proud of Marie uh, mm. and Ray for all the work they've done. And and thank you wish, for the work you uh, did with the legislature. It wouldn't have happened without either one of you. It just wouldn't have happened. Well, no problem at all. We, we thank you, and we will see you uh, next time on Then and Now.